This is a tool from psychotherapy to help you control any emotion. I know that sounds like a bold statement, but it only sounds bold if you're not aware of the research that shows just how effective this tool is. There's a whole body of scientific literature that shows that this tool is diverse enough to help you control any kind of emotion that you might have. And I know this from personal experience as well with my clients in my psychotherapy practice. I use this all the time. I've had clients use this during a job interview when they feel anxious and they need to turn that anxiety down a bit. I've had clients use this when they're feeling very depressed but they still need to engage in basic self-care. I've had clients even use this when they need to parent in a positive way but they feel a lot of anger and so in that moment they need to regulate that anger, they need to control it. This tool can help with all of those situations and way, way more. And what makes it even better is it's developed by one of the world's leading experts in this area of research. In the area of research with regards to emotion regulation, there's no name that's bigger than Professor James Gross. If you don't know about him, check him out. He's at Stanford University. So let's get into this tool from therapy and how you can use it in a practical way in these situations where you have to control some kind of emotion. Because at the end of the day, as the research shows, your ability to better regulate and better control your emotions is going to determine whether you fall victim to some of the worst mental health conditions and some of the worst physical health conditions. I mean, just as a quick example, the research shows that people who are not good at regulating their emotions are more prone to depression and anxiety. And the research also shows that those who are not good at regulating their emotions are also more prone to cardiovascular disease, which is one of the world's biggest killers. So this tool from therapy that I'm about to teach you is not just going to improve the quality of your life, it's also going to make you less vulnerable to some of the worst mental health and physical conditions. If that's not enough to get you interested, I don't know what is, but without further ado, here's the tool from therapy that's going to help you control your emotions. So it's called the process model of emotion regulation. As I said earlier, it was developed by Professor James Gross, and it's basically a model that tries to understand how we control our emotions. It's called emotion regulation because to regulate something means to control it. Or more specifically, when you're dealing with machinery, it means turning something up or down. Let's say, for example, you have a fan in your room. Oftentimes you'll notice that fans have little numbers that represent the different speeds of the fan. And so you can regulate the fan speed in that situation. That's what regulate means. You can go to a low fan setting if it's not such a warm day, but you can also go to quite a high fan setting if it's a very hot day. And the point that's important to understand with the word regulation is that there's always some end goal attached to it. So in the example of a fan, the end goal is to control your body temperature. It's possibly to make yourself cooler. So to make yourself cooler to meet that end goal, you have to regulate the fan speed. But this model of how we regulate machines can be applied to our own emotions as well. Hence the term emotion regulation, because this technique is going to show you how to turn up and turn down whatever emotion you're feeling. But again, remember, there has to be an end goal to it. So let's say, for example, your goal is to engage in positive parenting with your children, but you notice that you've been getting very angry at them and you feel a bit bad about this because they're just being children, you know? So you feel your anger in that situation is not something you want to take out on your children and it's going to get in the way of your goal of being a positive parent. In that situation, you need emotion regulation because to regulate that emotion, in other words, to turn it down a bit, is going to better help you meet that goal of being a positive parent. So that's an example of how you can have a goal for your life and how you may need to regulate an emotion to better help you meet that goal. But that's just one sort of situation in which you'll need to regulate an emotion. Professor James Gross makes us aware through his model that there are four situations in which you need to regulate your emotions. So in that situation that I just described, you're trying to turn down a negative emotion. But there might be situations in which you need to turn up a negative emotion. For example, if you're someone who goes to the gym, some people find it useful to engage their anger in that situation. If you're trying to be the positive parent, you want to turn down anger, but sometimes in the gym, especially if you're doing something like boxing or weightlifting, sometimes it's helpful to engage that anger and the energy that comes with it. In that case, you want to upregulate the anger. But that's just the first two scenarios in which you want to change a negative emotion. The second two scenarios involve a positive emotion because sometimes you want to turn up a positive emotion and even turn down a positive emotion. An example of wanting to turn up a positive emotion is perhaps 
it's the weekend and you feel mildly happy, but you want to have a fun weekend. And so you try to amp up some excitement, maybe through listening to music or meeting up with some friends. But the less intuitive example, the fourth scenario where you want to turn down a positive emotion could be a kind of situation where, uh, let's say you're at a funeral and you know it's inappropriate to laugh in that moment. Or let's say you're in class and, and you're feeling very giggly and you know you're going to get in trouble with your teacher. You need to downregulate the positive emotion in that moment. So you see, there are four kinds of varieties. When we think about controlling an emotion, most of us think about turning down a negative emotion. But you also need to know how to turn up a negative emotion sometimes. Sometimes you need to know how to turn up a positive emotion. And then finally, sometimes you need to turn down a positive emotion. And that leaves us with four kinds of scenarios. Now let's get into how to do this. Because what Professor James Gross makes us aware of is that if we want to know how to control an emotion, we have to know how emotions work. We have to know how emotions arise over time. So his model of emotion regulation is based on deeply understanding how an emotion is generated in the moment. He calls this the emotion generative process because it's how the emotion comes to be. And he believes that you can stop the emotion at many phases in it coming to be a fully grown emotion. And he also says that it's better to try to stop the emotion early on because then it's easier to control. So here are the four phases that an emotion goes through before it becomes fully formed. And then once we describe these four phases, I'm going to give you strategies that will help you stop the emotion at each phase, depending on how far the emotion has grown. So let's use the example of giving a public speech, because I know a lot of people are terrified about that, and they're oftentimes having to control their emotion in that moment. So let's say you have to give a public speech. The first thing you have to understand about an emotion is that it's an, usually a reaction to a situation. So in that example, the situation is that you have to give a public speech and you have to now stand at that podium and you have to speak to a bunch of random people. So that's the first step in the emotion generation sequence. Phase one is a, an activating situation. The second step is that you start to give your attention to things that makes that emotion bigger. So for example, while you're giving the public speech, you might be looking at the people in the crowd who aren't listening to you. Or you might be focusing your attention on the people who are frowning. Maybe they look a bit confused or a bit critical and you're focusing your attention on that. So the second phase in the emotion generation process is once you have a situation, you then pay attention to specific elements in that situation. The third step in the emotion generation process is actually assigning meaning to what you're paying attention to. So for example, if you're looking at the person who's frowning, you might assume that that person is being critical of you, that they think you're an idiot or something like that. But that might not be the case. It might be that they're frowning because there's a lot of sunlight, or maybe they're, they're squinting to see something on the board that's quite far away and they struggle with their vision. So in that example, you're adding a kind of meaning that makes the emotion even bigger. So you have the situation that activates the emotion. Step two takes us to deploying attention that makes the emotion even bigger. And then you assign a meaning that expands the emotion even further. Think about it as a balloon and at each phase it's getting bigger. And then finally, the fourth phase in the emotion generation process is when your body and mind and behavior start to respond to this emotion. So for example, in that situation of public speaking, as you notice that the person frowning looks very critical of you, you might start to sweat, you might start to shake a bit, you might decide to leave the stage because you're so nervous. In any case, those are all responses. So phase four is all about your response to how you're feeling the emotion. Now we get to the juicy part, how to regulate that emotion. Because Professor James Gross says that there are a set of techniques for each of these four phases. For the first phase, he has two sets of techniques, and for the other three, he has one sort of skill set for each of them. So we end up with five different skill sets, two for phase one, one for phase two, one for phase three, and one for phase four. So let's go through those skill sets so that you can get an idea of how you can control your emotion in those moments. And let's start with a skill set called situation selection. Situation selection is all about selecting the kind of situations that you want to put yourself into so that you can prevent negative emotions. If we follow this example of public speaking, you might select the situation in the sense that you might ask someone else to give the presentation. In that case, you've selected a situation in which you're in the crowd, you're not on the stage. So you've prevented the negative emotion from even arising 
That is how you can control that emotion is by being preventative and actually telling someone who's in charge of the event, look, I don't want to do this. Uh, Let someone else do it. Now, the second way in which you could do that, in which you could select the situation is maybe by changing the format of the talk that you have to give. Maybe you can record the talk beforehand and have it played live. Or perhaps you could turn the talk into a meeting with just a few important stakeholders who need to know that information. But either way, you see you've changed the situation so that you don't have to feel that emotion. Now, the second skill set that falls under the situational aspect is not selecting the situation, but just modifying the current situation that you're in. For example, you could still give the speech, so you haven't selected a different situation, but you can modify that setting. So you could stand behind a big podium that helps you feel very grounded and secure and where you're not Uh, seen that much and maybe that blocks your view as well so that you can't see that many people or you can modify the situation by having a colleague co-present with you or um, having a colleague give you feedback in real time at little interval breaks whenever you've stopped speaking in both of those situations you are modifying the situation you're not totally changing it you're not selecting a different situation you're just changing some aspects of the situation so that that anxiety doesn't arise as much So that's how you regulate your emotion using situation modification. Okay, so now let's move on to the skill set required for phase two of the emotion generation process. And remember, phase two is all about attention. What are you paying attention to? And the obvious skill that you need to get better at here is your ability to intentionally pay attention to the things that are going to be helpful in dealing with the emotion. You wanna get better at choosing what you pay attention to. So in this example of public speaking, You could shift your attention from looking at the crowds and looking at their frowns to actually looking at the content on your laptop so that you can better pay attention to that instead of letting the anxiety balloon by focusing on frowns. Or another way to focus your attention is you could focus your attention on your breathing. A lot of people find that helpful in dealing with anxiety. So in that example of focusing on your breathing, you're taking attention away from the thing that's making you more anxious. And that's how you're regulating emotion in phase two. It's through attentional deployment. Okay, now phase three, remember, is all about how you're interpreting the situation. It's all about the meaning that you're attaching to what you're paying attention to. So in this example, let's say that you do pay attention to the frowns on people's faces, and that makes you more anxious. You could check in with what interpretation you have there and you could, for example, reinterpret it as, as I said earlier, maybe it's just a bit of sunlight in their eyes. Maybe they they are struggling with their vision and they need to focus. The point here is that you want to give an interpretation that is helpful and you want to be wary of assuming things that are making you more anxious because at the end of the day, you don't need to assume what the frown means. You don't have to. You don't have to jump to a conclusion. You don't have to make an assumption. And you especially shouldn't be doing that when it's making you more anxious. And finally, you can regulate your emotion even in the fourth phase. So even if you can't choose the situation, you can't modify the situation, you can't choose what you're paying attention to, and you've already attached an anxious meaning, you can still choose how you respond to that situation. So for example, as you're doing the speech, something that people often find helpful is maintaining a light smile. Because if you maintain a light smile, your body sends feedback to your brain that you're actually in a good mood, which can help reduce the anxiety. Or you could perhaps maintain an open body posture, a very open body posture and stand upright. Because again, there's this biofeedback process that occurs where your body is sending signals to your brain that you are okay, you're safe, you're confident, you're open. And this is an example of how you can choose to respond, even if you've got to phase four of the emotion generation process. Another example of choosing how to respond is deciding that even if you feel anxious, you're not going to run away. You're not going to leave the stage. You're going to stay there and you're going to get through the presentation. Again, that's a response strategy for dealing with a difficult emotion. Now, one final thing, regulating your emotions might be the skill that you need to get better at but it also might not be the skill that you most need right now. It might be the case that your life is currently being plagued by limiting self-beliefs and you need to get better able at identifying those underlying beliefs and overcoming them. Or it could be that you need to develop the skill of willpower, the ability to do hard things, the ability to do something even when you don't feel like doing it. 
that could be the skill that you need right now in your life in this moment to better your life. So if you kind of don't know what personal growth aspect you need to focus on, I'd encourage you to check in the link below. I'm going to link my online course where I go through a personalized process where you can look through the personal growth skills that are available out there according to psychological science. And then you can go through the process of narrowing down the skills that are important for you to work on at the moment. If that's something you're interested in, I'll see you there.